Well, good morning, everyone. God is good. All the time. All the time. Amen. I want to welcome here to First Christian Church. And as always, every time we meet, we're here because Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead, and we're here to worship him. Amen. And that's what we're going to do. We're so glad that you are here with us. Uh, if you're a visitor, please take a card in the pew in front of you, fill it out, put it in the offering plate, and if you have a prayer request, please do the same. And I want to make a special welcome to the Mountain Mission Choir here today. Wow. We're, yeah. I think you're all singing in town at the Higher Ed Center this afternoon. What time does that happen? Or is there? Okay. And so they, they came here to worship with us today, and we are honored and privileged for you to be here. And they're going to be singing a benediction song at the very end of our service. So welcome to all of you, and we are so glad that you're here with us today. I think you saw all the announcements up on the screen. I'll just make a mention of next Sunday, we have our uh, dinner, our church dinner, right after the worship service. So if you'll bring a side item or dessert like we always do, uh, meat and drinks will be provided, and we will have a good time and there's always enough food, I promise you. And if you have something special you want to cook and bring, go ahead and bring it. I'm not bringing anything because I don't cook very good. And so that'll make it even better. So that's next Sunday, right after church. And then next Sunday evening at 5.30, we're going down to the Bristol Racetrack to see the lights. So if you'd like to join us for that, sign up sheet out there. I uh, hope you can do that. So lots of things happening. Uh, we're going to go ahead and pray. Our mission of the week, of course, in the bulletin is uh, Christian Missionary Fellowship. So we're going to pray for those folks. And we're also going to pray for Mountain Mission because they're right here with us today in the mission that they have. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. And most of all, Father, we thank you that you are here with us. And we pray, Lord, that everything that happens in this service today would bring honor to Christ our King. So thank you, Lord, for the gift of yourself to us. I pray for this church family. I pray for someone here today that doesn't know you as Savior. Today would be the day they make that decision. I pray for Christian Missionary Fellowship, Father, who has missionaries all over the world, that you would bless them and people would come to know Christ through their efforts. And I thank you and pray for Mountain Mission School, Father, and the ministry that they have. And I pray that you would bless them, keep this choir safe as they travel and as they sing, and people be blessed by their ministry. So watch over them, Lord, and we thank you for them. We love you, Lord, and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's Charlie. Well, good morning. Hey, you know, with all these great voices with us this morning, well, it'll sound pretty good this morning. So, hey, let's all stay and sing. Hey, it is Christmas time, you know. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come. 
Angels sing. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born. Silent night. as we come around the Lord's table and Brother Ken comes and shares with us. Beautiful song, Glorify the Name.
morning. Uh, this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something just a little bit different. We haven't done, so don't don't think nothing bad about it. It's okay. Uh, if you're here as a Christian today, I'd like for each one of you just to close your eyes, keep them closed till I end up with prayer, and I want you to examine yourself and to see if you think you're worthy of taking communion this morning and for what it means to you and for communion, you know, when we partake of, uh, of the bread and juice, it represents Jesus' body and his shed blood, but Truly, sometimes I think we get in a habit, we just take it and we don't think about are we worthy or are we not worthy or anything. But uh, So if you'll just close your eyes and think, then I'll go over it and then have a prayer, okay? This is about what the Lord's Supper means to us. When we asked how the Lord's Supper should be meaningful to the Christian today, three concepts relating to the past, present, future can be helpful. First, the Lord's Supper is a time of remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me. This is not so much our dwelling on the agonies of the crucifixion as it is the marvelous life and ministry of our Savior. In the Lord's Supper, Christians proclaim their deliverance from the sin through the death of Christ. Second, the Supper is a time of refreshing and communion as we participate in benefits of Jesus' death and resurrection life, we are actually being nourished and empowered from the risen Christ through the Spirit. Third, the supper is a time of recommitment. We are to examine, literally prove or test ourselves and partake in a worthy manner. In so doing, we renew our dedication to Christ till he comes. After Christ's return, we shall partake with him in his physical presence in the kingdom. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can come here and gather together, Lord, and, and uh, partake of this communion time that in, in freedom as much as anything, Lord. Lots of people don't have that opportunity to do that. And Father, I pray that we would each examine ourselves, each one of us, that and see what truly we should be doing and what we should get out of communion time and for what you have done for us, Lord, how you have blessed us. And Father, I just pray that each one of us would try to serve you better, be a better Christian, and to worship you in a way that be pleasing to you, Lord. Father, I ask that you go with us and forgive us where we fail you. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <coughs>
You know, uh, we're getting pretty close to Christmas time, and uh, I just hope and pray that each of us can keep Christ first when it comes to Christmas, that we won't get overrun with gifts, gift buying and exchanging gifts with each other and whatnot. But, you know, if, if you've ever given somebody a gift, and when they open it, and they act like they like it or love it or whatever, it makes you feel real good as a giver. You know, you feel like you've, you've done a good job. But as we get ready to take up the offering this morning, you know, it's not about the amount you put in. It's the way, the attitude of your mindset, what you think about. And, and God knows you can't outgive him. You can try, but I can tell you a lot of stories, but it'd take me a while. He's blessed me so many times that it's, uh, it's just not even th to be able to think about it. But uh, anyway, as we do it, he would be real happy. I think would make him pleased if you give it with a cheerful heart and because you really want to give it, you want to glorify him and to see his kingdom grow here on this earth. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to give back a portion that you give us. We know you own everything, Lord. You let us use it. We thank you for that, Lord. And Father, we just pray you'll continue to bless us so that we can give. And we pray for those who don't have to give, Lord, that you will be in their body, Lord, be in their heart, help them to realize that it's okay, Lord. And Father, this morning I pray that you would be glorified by what we do for you. And maybe use this money to glorify your kingdom and to further your kingdom here on this earth, Lord. And I pray that the people that is over the use of this money would use it wisely, Lord, and just for you and to glorify you. Father, again, we ask you to forgive us and where we fail you. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> This is the time of our service where we open it up for prayer requests, um, new prayer requests. We ask that everybody look in their bulletin. We keep a, a running list of everyone in need of prayer, and we'll also open it up for uh, uh, any praises. So I'm going to start by reading off the cards that we've received this morning. Please remember the family of 
Burgess Blankenship. See, I think this is a, okay, this is a guest, Logan Patrick, welcome, happy to have you with us this morning. Uh, please remember the family of Frank Mink, they're, uh, they're having his funeral services today, so please keep that family in our prayers. Ashley Walton, um, she's experiencing uh, kidney failure, so please, please keep her in your prayers. And also, Wanda Money, she, uh, she has, has had a heart attack, so please keep her in our prayers. Uh, and I'd like to start out by letting ever, just thanking everybody for their prayers, for me and my family. Uh, my grandfather passed a couple of weeks ago, so the prayers were felt, and the support from the fam uh, church family was felt as well, so thank you very much, and continue to pray especially for my father, as it's going to leave a, a void with him and his family, as my grandfather had lived with him for about the last 10 years. So please keep them in, in your prayers. Is there anyone else? Prayer requests first? Hey, Ken. Uh, Chad Kevin's he has the flu, so pray for him that he get better. And I also pray that Megan and Beth don't get it. Yes. Kevin and flu, and pray that... Uh, Megan and Beth don't get the, get the flu. They've had my sister had a fall this week, had a pretty good size, not on her head, so she's just banging up one side to another, it looks like. Who's that? Freedom. Okay. David's sister Rita had a fall, so please keep her in your prayers. Anyone else? Shirley? Yeah. Ron, Ron Snowden, remember Ron, he's not feeling well. Kenny? Um, along the same lines, I you was know, with my father most of the day yesterday. And he went up to about 9.30 today, which is completely unlike him, so I had a feeling we might already be done with it in my house. So keep gotcha. it together for prayers. Plus, I also have a praise, Hunter and Brianna and Heather and, and myself and Matt Hyde have been working on my cousin Nathan and his wife Kayla to come to church and we're here today. Yeah. Great. Is there anyone else for a prayer? Richard? Uh, this is not a praise, but uh, Mary's sister, uh, Connie, it is a praise. <laughs> Mary's sister, Connie Sales. Last week, had surgery, and she had diagnosed lung cancer. Uh, the praise part is she's at home. Okay. Connie Sales had lung cancer, and she's been at UVA, and, and uh, the praise is that she's at home now, and, and hopefully there's some signs that she may be recovering. So, Lisa? I have a praise that I'm very thankful for all the women in the church come together and poor Heidi and uh, we had a great time yesterday with the ornament exchange and uh, just a great bunch of sisters to have. Yeah. Lisa's praises for the women of the church and thanking Heidi for all of her work that she did on uh, putting together the outing yesterday and I heard that everybody had a really good time so any more prayers? Or praises. We'll just open it up for prayers or praises. Just want to welcome our guests and just hope you guys feel at home. And it's a blessing to have you guys worship with us today. So it's an honor for us. So thank you. If there's no one else, if you would, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for another day to, to be able to come here and worship you. The freedom we have to be able to come and worship without fear for ourselves and our lives, and ourselves and our family, Lord, that is truly a blessing. We just give, uh, give you all the honor, the glory, Lord. Without you, we would be hopeless. We'd be hopeless in this world. 
And we thank you for the greatest gift that you could possibly ever give us. And that was your son Jesus and that sacrifice that you gave your only son. That if we would just believe in him, that we could have everlasting life, Lord. It is just the greatest gift of the season. And I pray that we all remember that, Lord. I pray if there's one lost that today, here today, that today would be the day that they would accept that gift and come to know you, Lord, so that we can all be in paradise together. Pray for the service today. Pray that you'll uh, work through Tom. Pray that the message touches everyone here, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Ken. Connie, good job on the piano. Way to go. Hey, I should have done this at the beginning, but uh, I want you to know that the new president of Mountain Mission School is here today. And um, I think you'll recognize him. Some of you probably know him, but he has strong connections to this church, and that's Chris Mitchell. Chris, we're so glad and we're proud of you for taking on that job, and we know you will do well, and our prayers are with you. But that's Teresa Hurley's brother. And many of you remember Maxine years ago, who was a member here. That was Chris's mother. And of course, Mike and his family, that's his brother too. So you got strong connections here, man. And we're praying for you. So we're very, very proud of you. All right, so let's stand and greet each other for a couple minutes. Greet each other warmly. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I think that's the way it's supposed to be. I mean, after all, what kind of God would he be if we understood everything about him? Wouldn't be much of a God, would he? He'd be sort of like us. Wouldn't be very impressive. Our God is awesome. He's awesome. He's the creator. He can speak things into existence. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. Time has no hold on him. He knows the number of hairs on your head. How many red blood cells are streaming through you right now? He knows the number of stars and the grains of sands on all the seashores. He sees the mysterious creatures at the bottom of the ocean. He takes notice of every creature on earth. Every bug, every fish, every bird, virus, crawling thing, walking thing is under his dominion. Nothing escapes his notice. He's never shocked or overwhelmed. Oh, what are we going to do now? He's never like that. 
He doesn't wring his hands wondering what to do next. He's the Lord of all, and he's the master of all. His holiness is beyond comprehension. His glory is inconceivable. The universe and everything in it belongs to him. There is no one and no thing that can withstand him. He alone is to be praised and worshiped. Hallelujah. That's the kind of God we have. He's amazing. And so the question is, why would such an awesome God rescue his people from sin and destruction in such an unlikely way that he did? Why would he do that? The Christmas account of Jesus coming to save us, man, from our perspective, it just doesn't make any sense. But he's God. He could have destroyed sin in a word. He could have redeemed us with a command, but he did not. Why? He chose to rescue us in a way I believe that only he could come up with. Only he could come up. It's so outside of our human reasoning. You know, you, you start to understand it if you really get into the scriptures of how God operates and how he's saved us. Okay, first of all, let's review what we said last week about this unlikely rescue. Okay, remember, we, we need to be rescued from sin, rescued from ourselves. How did God do it? The first thing was the rescuer, Jesus, comes as a baby. And in poverty of all things. That doesn't sound like much of a rescuer, does it? And the second thing is the rescuer himself has to run for his life. At least his parents had to take him as a baby and run to Egypt so he could survive. Again, doesn't sound like much of a rescue going on. But let's continue today. The third thing that's in this unlikely rescue is this. The rescuer dies. For those he came to rescue. Remember in John 15, 13, Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. I got a picture here of a movie made years ago. Some of you may have seen it. It's called Saving Private Ryan. You remember that movie? You know, the gist of the movie was there was a family that had about four guys that were in World War II, and three of the sons had already been killed, and they wanted to find the last one to go and take him away from the war so the mother wouldn't have to lose all of her sons. And in the course of that movie, there were several people who were trying to save Private Ryan who gave up their lives so that he could live. Greater love has no one to give up his life for his friends. You know, Jesus comes as a baby and he grows up to be a man. At age 30, he gives up the carpenter shop and he begins a ministry that will change the world. And, who, and again, so unlikely, who does this rescuer surround himself with? Fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, former demon-possessed people. He hangs around sinners and prostitutes. What kind of rescue is this anyway? He shows his glory in small segments during miracles and healing and raising people from the dead. And he teaches the greatest truths ever taught. And the religious leaders are threatened by him and have had enough. And they have him arrested. And this rescuer is then mocked, abused, tortured, spit upon, and crucified. Listen in Mark 15. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Man, this is the rescue! This is the rescue of us. And from our perspective, it doesn't sound like it's going, going too well, does it? The rescuer dies in shame, and he's being mocked and ridiculed. He was spit upon for me and you. He had chunks of his beard ripped out for me and you. He took it all. Mark 15 continues. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you are the one going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down from the cross. Save yourself. 
In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said. He can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. You know, as hard as it is for us to believe at this point, God's rescue plan is in full swing. It's going exactly as it's supposed to go, according to God. Jesus is now carrying all of mankind's sins, yours and mine and everyone's, on that cross. John says in chapter 19, later, knowing now all was completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, and they soaked a sponge in it and put a sponge on the stalk of a hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bows his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus dies. That's part of the rescue. It's going perfectly according to plan. And then, point number four in this rescue, the rescuer seals the deal. And of course, this message sounds easy. This sounds like an Easter message. Yeah, it does. Because you cannot separate Christmas and Easter. The Messiah came, and this is why he came. In Mark 28, the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen. Just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Hallelujah. Death cannot hold him. Death itself cannot hold Jesus. He proves who he is. And how does he do it? Does he appear in the temple? You know, you'd think, okay, if, if, if we were in charge of this rescue and, and they crucified Jesus and he rose from the dead, who would we have Jesus go see first? Maybe the chief priest, right? Say, hey, you guys, you want a piece of this now? Huh? Huh? What are you going to say now? Or, or, or maybe, you know, to the soldiers that crucified him, hey, you want to try that hammer on me again, boys? Or maybe to the crowd that was shouting at him a week before, you know, crucify him. What do you say to me now? He doesn't do any of that because that's not the way God operates. The first people that he sees, the first person really is a woman. A woman was not thought of a lot in that culture. They were second-class citizens, and that's who Jesus comes to first. And a woman who was formerly demon-possessed, that's the kind of God we serve. He doesn't gloat. He comes to save. He comes to heal. Why such an unlikely rescue, anyway? Well, I believe Scripture explains it. Now, two points, then we'll be done. I think the first reason for the unlikely rescue is God wants everyone to be saved. And so, for, and so he is exceedingly patient. 2 Peter 3.9 the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's that old free will thing kicking in, isn't it? You know, God is not going to force himself on anybody. He's not going to get you in a hammer lock or put you down on the mat until you tap out. It's a free choice. It's a free choice. And the question is, what else could God possibly do to prove his love for us? What else could he do? He spent 2,000 years now being patient. And there are still people that resist him. And he still waits, hoping and praying that people will accept him. One day, the opportunity for rescue will be over. And it will be too late. But so far, and even up today, it's not too late. The second reason I think this unlikely rescue is now we have a Savior that we can relate to. 
You know, he's not a God that's far off and we can't, we're just mesmerized. You know, we now have a Savior that we can identify with. In Hebrews 4, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess, profess. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus came as a man, and he lived like we do. He was born like we are born, of a woman. And so Jesus not only, he doesn't, he's not theorizing about how we feel. He sympathizes with us because he's been there. He stood where we stand. He's faced the things that we faced. You know, for example, you know, we thought, I said, well, I've had a really tough life. Well, so did Jesus. He can identify with that. He was born in a stable and lived a life as a peasant. He said, man, I have family responsibilities that weigh me down. Well, so did Jesus. Joseph was probably gone when he was a young man. He had to take responsibility for his family. And what was his response, you know, their response to him? They, they came one time and tried to take him back home because they thought he was crazy. Yeah, he had family problems. The people slander you, maybe, and say lies about you. Well, Jesus can identify with that. They called him illegitimate. They accused him of being a glutton and a drunkard. Are you under a lot of pressure? Jesus can identify with you there. Crowds followed him everywhere. There were times he couldn't even go into town. There were so many people. There were times he didn't even have time to eat because the crowds were pressing him. There were times he had to go out on a boat to preach. Are you lonely? Have your friends let you down? Boy, can Jesus identify with you. Judas sold him. Peter denied him with oaths and curses. His closest friends deserted him in his darkest hour. The crowd who screamed favor at one minute were screaming crucify him a few days later. Are you in pain? Jesus understands that. They put a thorn of crowns on his head. They, they, they drove nails in his hands and feet. He knows what it feels like to hurt. The people ridicule you? Jesus knows. They laughed at him and they taunted him as he hung dying on a cross, probably naked. He understands us. So when we go to him in prayer, he gets it. He knows what we're feeling. He's perfect. He's the perfect savior. He's the perfect rescuer. He's not only sympathetic, but he's now powerful. And he's able to answer prayers. We can relate to God because of Jesus. He knows what it's like. And what better way for, for a God to come and rescue us than to come as we do, to live like we do? The unlikely way of our rescue makes perfect sense when you look at it from God's perspective, doesn't it? He could have forced our love. You bow down to me right now. And we could have had to do it. But he didn't do it that way. He didn't. We could have succumbed to his will through sheer intimidation. You will bow down. I am God. That's not his way either. The day is coming when he comes back. Yes, every knee will bow. But this is the age of grace where we can get to him through our own free will and accept his gift. And the unlikely rescue at Christmas is the perfect way that God got this message across to lost humanity. This is the age of grace. Today is the day of salvation. One day the door will be closed, and it will be too late. And the next time Jesus comes, as we said last week, he will not come as a baby. He will not be running for his life. There'll be nobody spitting on him. There'll be nobody ripping chunks of beard out of him. There'll be nobody driving nails in his hands and feet. He will come in power as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the message of Christmas. Do you know him? Do you know him? We're going to stand and sing. Ask Charlie and the group to come up.
You know, the message of Christmas is love. And if you don't know him as Savior, I pray as we sing, you would come and give your life to him through faith and confession and repentance, being baptized into him. Rise up, get the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then when he comes back again, you'll be happy. You won't be running for your life. You'll be rejoicing. So let's sing together. If you have a need today, please come forward.